Well, I'd like to introduce Sai, who will uh, be talking about cognitive psychology for hackers. As we all know, the usual, the, you can have the most perfectly engineered system in the world. Unfortunately, it's used by a faulty lump of meat <laughs> in front of it. And uh, Sai will be telling us what is wrong with said faulty lump of meat. Oh, there is so much wrong. <laughs> The trick is uh, uh, just to not have users. So, uh, without further ado, uh, I give you Sai. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, wow, that's actually a whole lot of you. Uh, so, this is something you guys may have seen on the interwobs. Um, it's an interesting animation. It's one of... Uh, a large number of animations called bi-stable images. Um, the trick uh, in this particular case is uh, if you look at any particular corner and pretend that's the top corner, you can switch to which direction it's rotating. Try it. So uh, unlike what you have seen on the internet, this doesn't have anything to do with left brain, right brain, or uh, any of the bullshit they usually ascribe to left brain, right brain. So, uh, before I begin, obviously, Twitter tag so I can find your stuff later. Uh, if you have questions, please just shout them out if they are short questions. If not, please wait until the end. There's going to be an extended Q&A where I'll give more uh, information and uh, ask, answer more questions and maybe give some more examples tonight. Uh, if you know one of the examples, um, I'm going to use. Please nod your head when you see it, just so I know uh, about uh, how many people are uh, aware of it. Uh, don't spoil the people near you, and we should chat. Yeah? Okay, given the number of people that we have in the room, if you, shout, if you, if you hear a shouted question, um, can you repeat the question oh, yeah, back to the audience? Because obviously not everybody yeah, here yeah. is going to hear it. Yeah. Um, likewise, for the extended Q&A, we're going to have a, someone uh, with a couple of mics to pass around because, again, we've got a lot of people in the room and we need to make sure that everyone can hear the question, okay? Yeah. Um, and as those of you who may have uh, seen my talk last year will know, the way I give presentations is a bit unusual. I'm going to need your participation. And that includes you guys watching this stream or online. Um, don't cheat. Uh, there are going to be a few things where I uh, split you up. I'll explain that later. Uh, but answer honestly, commit to your answer, uh, and yes, I am messing with your head. Um, I promise to tell you about it afterwards. Um, so be honest, and you'll get more out of this. First off, a short video for you. I'll get back to that later. So cognitive science is actually this huge, huge field. Um, it's probably the most massively interdisciplinary field in modern academia. Um, I am a grad stu student. Uh, my field is social neuroscience. What I study is how empathy works in the brain and how it correlates with motor skills. Um, so that's sort of a sub-branch of uh, psychological neuroscience or neuropsychology or cognitive psychology. Um, but even just that little line on this chart is very, very, very large. And I can only get to a very small portion of it. So the portion I'm getting to is, are you rational? How many people think they are? Show of hands. Good rationalists? Yeah? No. You are not. <laughs> and I'm going to show you how you are not. Um, it's okay. 
There are partially fixes. Uh, there are ways you can exploit this in other people. Uh, but it's good to know. So here's a first example. Which one of these is larger? The number of words starting with R or the number of words with R in the third position? Who thinks number of words starting with R? Show of hands. Who thinks number of words with R in the third position? <sighs> Damn it. <laughs> Most people think it's not. Uh, it's actually R in the third position in English and in German. Um, another example of the same sort of effect. Which one of these is larger? Uh, deaths from cancer or accidents, suicide, and homicide combined? Who thinks cancer? Who thinks accidents, suicide, homicide? Okay. Uh, sub question. How about homicide versus suicide? Who thinks there's more homicides? Murder. Murder. Who thinks there's more murder? Who thinks there's more suicide? Ooh, well informed group. <laughs> Except about the cancer. Cancer is actually the second leading cause of death in the United States. Accidents, not so much. Um, so this gets to something that uh, I was talking about yesterday, which is the perception of risk is very flawed. <laughs> yes, it's true. Um, this especially goes to terrorism, and I think it's summed up best by the following in SMBC comic. So the key word here is availability. What you see in the news uh, is not representative of the whole sample of what happens. What is reported, and for that matter what you remember, is the stuff that's salient, the stuff that's emotionally gripping, the stuff that you've seen recently, that's happened to a friend of yours, that you've heard about. And that's not the same thing as actually the numbers. So what are the effects of this? For one, ads do work. Especially, it turns out, they work on people who think that they don't work on them. Um, why? Because when you're in the store and you're deciding whether to buy A or B, and you've just seen more of A, there is something called the mere exposure effect, which makes you think A is better because you've been exposed to it more. Uh, the other thing is, just because something is scary, like somebody bringing a bomb on the airplane and asking about the radio, uh, doesn't mean that it's actually a higher threat. You're more likely to be killed driving to the airport than you are by any threat of terrorism at all. Another is suggestion. Uh, there are lots of stage magicians who use this. It does work, um, and I, I don't have time to get into it, but it's not quite what they portray on stage. Um, how can you fix this? Well, think about it. Instead of reasoning from an example, instead of saying, okay, I, I have thought of some answer to my question, and there, I'm gonna base my answer on that. No, uh, think it out. Try to say, what have I not thought of? So in the case of the letters, you don't usually have an index sorting your vocabulary by third letter. You do by first letter. That's highly available. You can think of a lot of words that start with R. You can't think easily of words that start with the third, or whose third letter is R. Uh, I would bet that all of you who voted that third letter R was more common, you probably are suspicious more than you're thinking of words with the third letter R. Um, and there's one bonus here, though, which is that if you're more familiar with something, if there are more available uh, examples, uh, it becomes less scary. For example, in the United States, gay marriage is a giant issue right now. Uh, Population-wise, it's split 
almost 50-50, not quite. Um, most are against gay marriage. Turns out, however, that people who know at least one person who's gay have radically different views. Why? Because, OMG, we're not scary. Um, there are uh, flip sides, of course. If your uh, um, background leads you to believe in religion very strongly, you'll see it. Um, people see faces on the moon. People see faces in cheese products. People see faces in a lot of things. <laughs> It's just a matter of what's salient to you. So I'm gonna use a few uh, tests that I have to split up the room to do. Those of you watching this uh, online, you need to do this too. So choose a side, wall group or door group. Those of you here, you have a wall group and door group. Wall group, door group, ta-da. So you're gonna see this. Uh, so, if the check mark is on your side of the room, keep your eyes open. If the X is on your side of your room, close your eyes, okay? Don't peek. <coughs> Nod once you finish reading what's on the slide. I'm not going to speak it so the other side doesn't hear. Uh, and commit to your answers when I ask you all the, a question afterwards. Don't, like, look over and see what the other guys are doing before you answer, okay? So. Suppose you're taking to a trip to Iraq. How much would you pay for the following? Close your eyes. Close, close, close. Good. Nod when you've done reading. OK. OK, close your eyes. Open. Other side. Ready? Nod when you're done reading. Okay, good. Oh, everybody, open your eyes. How much would you pay? So raise your hands. Would you pay $5? Max, exactly. Of, so pick one, sorry. Would you pay $5? Would you pay $7? Would you pay $9? Would you pay $11? 13? Hmm. So there is an interesting uh, thing. So the, what I showed you was this. That side got a more specific elicitation. Any act of terrorism outside the green zone. The other side got a more general one. Obviously, this one covers more, but it's less specific. It's less easy to imagine. And therefore, people actually value it less, relatively speaking. So here's a different example, perhaps a little bit uh, more overt. Suppose you have a six-sided die. Four sides are green, two sides are blue. You roll it 20 times. You get to bet on one of these three. If the sequence comes up, you win. If it doesn't, you don't. Which do you bet on? Who chooses A? Who chooses B? Who chooses C? OK. Those of you who picked B, what the hell? B is strictly worse than A. B requires you to get a green before you get A. Think about it. <laughs> so the reason you picked B is because B has four blues and two greens. It's more representative. It's more similar to what you were expecting the overall outcome to be. But there's no way that B is more likely to happen than A. It's just not possible. So this thing of representativeness is present in a lot of situations. Detailed scenarios seem more likely. They seem more uh, relatable. But they're not um, more likely, that is. They are more relatable. Politicians know this. So when you hear politicians saying, 
I met a woman named Jane Doe, and she had a nice dog. And she was a strong supporter of insert issue here. Uh, they know what they're doing. They're making it personal. Does this mean that the majority of the population in, uh, supports that issue? No, but it's more relatable. Uh, similarly with risks, if you're hearing in the news about terrorism all the time uh, and how there's you know, people in Israel or people elsewhere blowing themselves up, wiping out 30 people, that seems really, really scary. Um, but it doesn't seem all that scary to walk across the street. Guess which is going to kill you more likely? <laughs> Similarly on pricing, so that the thing I showed you with uh, a more detailed scenario, guess what, if I were to chop it up and say, uh, instead of offering you an all-inclusive uh, death insurance package for your trip, uh, I would say, okay, how much would you pay for insurance from terrorism? X, okay, how about insurance from accidents? How about insurance from this other thing? How about, what is the total of X plus Y plus Z plus et cetera versus the single package? It's a lot more. And you can exploit this online. You can exploit this in uh, how you actually price things in the commercial world. It's, in fact, done. It works. Um, instead of estimating how, what something is going to cost you, what a risk is, try actually calculating. Try actually getting, say, the CDC to tell you. Here's a interesting question. So in pilot training in the Air Force, they noticed an interesting pattern. Uh, some pilots performed a landing really well. Because of that, they got praised. The next day, they performed worse. Others performed really poorly. Because of that, they were criticized. Afterwards, they performed better. So what's the conclusion? What do you think? So, <laughs> good insight. So, here is an application. Suppose you're testing the IQ of 50 random kids. Generally, the average IQ is 100. The first one is a genius. You still have 49 kids to test. What do you expect their total IQ average to be? Who thinks it's 99? Raise your hand. Who thinks it's 100? Who thinks it's 101? OK, those of you who think it's 100, you would suck at gambling. <laughs> Here's a slightly different problem. Suppose you're testing the IQ of two random kids. You test the first one, he's a genius. What do you expect the average IQ to be? If you expect the average IQ to be 100, that means you have doomed number two to be an idiot. <laughs> no, they're independent. You expect them to be 100. It's 101 total. Things tend towards the center, but that doesn't mean that every case is the same. Here's a different example. Suppose you have cystic fibrosis. Cystic fibrosis is a very serious disease. It clogs your lungs and it makes it so you don't breathe. It's not permanently treatable, but it is manageable with medication that will keep you out of the hospital and living for at least a decade or two. Um, it's very, very serious. Now, suppose that your chance of a complication is 0.5% uh, per day. If you have one, you'll be in the hospital and it'll cost you 20 grand. You're offered a new pill, which will reduce that chance to 0.05% per day. How much would you pay for it? Shout it out. Universal health <laughs> <laughs> Communist. <laughs> nice try, but the answer to that is how much should your government pay per day? <laughs> <laughs> per day, 2000 $10 a day? 
Less than a dollar a day? <laughs> How much is it worth? Just think. You have to answer it. Participate yourself. What, what would you pay for this? So it does have a precise answer. And this is the answer. 0.5% per day is a massive, massive risk. That is 83% chance per year that you will be in the hospital as opposed to 16%. That pill is worth about 40 bucks a day. Everybody underestimates this. Not only that, actual cystic fibrosis patients who are actually at risk of having a serious complication and possibly dying will change from a treatment that would have given them 0.05% per day to 0.5% per day because they don't see any result. They don't see a difference. As a result, they die. It's a very serious problem. And the reason is you don't realize it, but rare things happen a lot if you have enough tests. So um, an example is, you know those people who are religious and they say they had this amazing experience uh, that was one in a million, or their friend did. And it's a miracle, right? There's no way this could have happened. The question is though, how many chances were there for that to happen? How many chances in your lifetime are you taking where something incredibly rare might happen? In fact, it's expected that a miracle will happen to you or a friend of yours. In fact, if it doesn't, that would be surprising. <laughs> and you don't need a God for that. I'm not commenting on whether there is or isn't a God. You're welcome to believe as you like. But that in particular is a bad reason. Um, another thing that's a bad reasoning is uh, people who perform really well, like stockbrokers, um, suppose a stockbroker, for example, wins the market 20 years in a row and beats the S&P 500. Do you think this stockbroker is incredibly amazing and you should listen to their tapes and buy their stock? The question is, how large of a population is there? How many stockbrokers are you choosing from? If you're choosing from many thousands and this 20 year history is over a larger history when the stock market has been operating, it would actually be surprising for at least one of them not to have succeeded, not to have had essentially heads come up 20 times in a row. It's a matter of how often you test. Here's a very different effect. Suppose a city is getting sued for failing to reinforce a bridge against flooding. They assess the probability, they did look at it, and they concluded that it just wasn't worth the money. They had other things to spend the money on. But they're getting sued now, and you're on the jury. You also have one extra bit of information. So, close your eyes, half of the room. This is your extra bit. Okay, nod, yeah. Okay, close your eyes, other, open, other side of the room, open up. This is your extra bit. Nod. Got it? Okay. So, everybody open their eyes. What do you think? You're on the jury. Do you award damages or not? Was the city negligent in failing to reinforce the bridge? Who thinks yes? Who thinks no? So this side of the room answered no more often. Want to know why? This is what I told them, that the bridge had no problems for 10 years. The other side, 
I said the same thing. I also said after 10 years, something happened. The thing is, you don't assess negligence by what happened. You have to assess it by what people knew at the time. The problem is, if you're on a jury, you can't ignore this. If I were to explicitly tell you, ignore this last part of your prompt, ignore the fact that it was in fact washed out, just take into account what they knew at the time, you would have practically no difference in result. You can't prevent this. So uh, an, an, another example is... Uh, in, in what happened, you have the potential of what could, be, uh, what, what could happen. I did say that the city assessed a probability of flood. I didn't tell either group how likely it was. I didn't tell you how likely it was. The point is, um, you have to add to the risk um, the damage. It's not only probability, but the damage uh, that's created when it happens. And they had no idea if you had how it happened. You should repeat that for the stream. Fair. Okay. So. He's saying that uh, the group that I didn't tell the, that the bridge was washed out by a flood, they didn't realize that a flood might wash out the bridge and kill people. My apologies. Um, nevertheless, this effect is real. Um, another, one example in your, sorry? Citation needed. Citation needed. Uh, the citation is on the slide at the bottom. After this talk, you'll be able to download the slides on my website. So one of the uh, examples you might need in your commercial life is suppose you're arguing about how to solve a problem and someone comes up with one idea. The moment you think of one idea, you are contaminated. You cannot think about it other than with respect to that idea. That is why if you're brainstorming, you should tell people to shut up about any solutions to the problem until it has been thoroughly discussed what the problem is, what the issues are. And only then do you propose ways to address it. So remember that bomber video? Here we go. Uh, video at the beginning. Uh, that had some sort of embedding problem. So, which of these persons did it? Who would you convict? Number seven. Number three. Well, it turns out actually none of them. <laughs> um, by asking you which one did it, not showing you one after another, and uh, asking whether this person was it, you compare them. You see, uh, is this one more likely than the guy next to him? And as a result, you convict an innocent person. And this happens all the time, unfortunately. Um, a different example is this. So you look at this and you see the letter I. I look at this and I see a zombie. <laughs> now, so do you. What do you see when you look at this? You see a Dalmatian once you realize there is a Dalmatian to see. See it? Once you see it, the next time I show you this image, or if you see it later, you'll see it much, much, much more quickly. 
Here's another example. FedEx logo, everyone knows this, right? How about this? That's very intentional, um, make no mistake. Uh, this one is probably not quite as intentional. Uh, my apologies to any Cisco engineers in the audience. <laughs> I don't actually have anything against Cisco. They make great products. I just think this is funny. <laughs> Um, so as those of you who've been in, on, in the internet know, there are some things you can't unsee um, or unthink. Uh, so here's a very different example of this. Um, sorry? <laughs> The color of the words on the next slide. <laughs> so uh, those of you whose uh, native language is English, read the left side. Those of you whose native language is German on the right side. Those of you neither, pick one. <laughs> uh, try to ignore the te text. Just read the color that the words are printed in from top to bottom as fast as you can. OK, ready? Go. Okay, now I'm going to do another one. Ready? Go! Uh, so, this is called the Stroop effect. Um, Turns out this is actually an amazingly flexible effect. Um, you can use it in a lot of different situations. And it's basically impossible to shut down the part of your brain that interprets these as language, except in a couple situations, which I'll get to in a sec. Um, the reason is this is interference. One part of your brain is processing it at one level, and another is trying to do an unrelated process, namely, just read the color. But the part of your brain saying, oh, that's the word green, is interfering with the part of the brain saying, oh, that's the color red. And as a result, the color red gets slowed down in the crossfire. Um, there are a lot of other examples of this. So one very uh, cool demo, I think, is um, there was this experiment where they stop people in a hallway. Uh, the, the subjects had been asked to do a mental math problem while they were uh, going from one room to the other room where they were going to be uh, taking a test. So in the first room, uh, they're given a series of numbers and they're told, uh, memorize these numbers or add them up or something. And then they, they're going to another room. Uh, in the middle of the hallway, they're randomly uh, uh, comes up uh, a person and then offers them a choice. Would you like a brownie or this healthy uh, uh, plate of vegetables? What do you think the answer will be differently depending on whether the person is thinking of a problem versus if they are just walking from one room to the next and they don't have something to work on? Which one will go for the brownie? <laughs> Both of them. Which one will more go for the brownie? <laughs> the answer is the one who's told to think about something. The reason is that the kind of thinking that makes you say, oh, I should have that healthy tomato instead of that brownie is the part of your brain that is being uh, stack overflowed by the other issue. Um, this is a real attack. 
<laughs> uh, there are other examples of it. Con artists, for example, uh, use uh, a, what's called a, a currency uh, exchange uh, or a, um, a uh, what's it called? Um, a giving change attack. So they confuse the mark by saying, I, I have 20 bucks, but I need to change it midway, and the person loses track, and it gets complicated, and the result is that the con artist walks away with more money than he originally had, which is usually the result. Um, another example is if you're social engineering someone, and uh, you get them occupied in thinking about one thing, and then you ask them to do something that is essentially an emotional task, they will react much more basically without as much supervision of it than they would if they were explicitly uh, trying to be careful about what they think, what they say, what they feel, being good little citizens. Um, the reason is these are sort of different levels of processing, different depths of processing. Um, and when you're preoccupied, your impulse goes up. Uh, another interesting result of this is something called paradox of choice. Uh, if you're presented with a large array of options, uh, normally people think, oh, that's awesome. I have more things to choose from. I'll make a better, uh, I'll make a better choice as a result. Um, what happens is people actually are less satisfied with the choice that they make. The reason is they keep comparing it to the possibility of a hypothetical optimum choice that they didn't make. Um, and they keep saying, oh, well, this choice that I'm now familiar with, and it turns out it's not perfect, and it turns out, you know, the GUI kind of sucks. Um, and I did, the, this other choice that I could have made, that one was perfect. So this one must suck. Um, versus if you only give them a couple choices, like Apple does, <laughs> um, they don't have that instinct. They don't have as much need to compare. And this is why Apple sells better than Windows. <sighs> one of the reasons. Obviously not the only one. Um, another issue is uh, something called Spock syndrome. This is actually a neurological disease. Uh, it's not something you can easily acquire. It's usually a, a result of st a stroke. Um, what happens to people with Spock syndrome is they are basically emotionless uh, with respect to any sort of events in their lives. They're coldly logical. So what do you think happens to the decision making of these people? Do you think it gets easier or harder? harder. Yeah. Um, it gets a lot harder, in fact. And the reason is because they can't figure out a value. If you give them two pens, and you say, which pen would you like? They're like, oh, that one is more shiny. But that one writes better. Ah! <laughs> the reason is there's no logical reason to prefer shiny over writing better. And so that part you actually have to resolve emotionally. Um, so one counter attack to this, uh, the Stroop task is actually hypnosis. Um, if you hypnotize someone before the task and you say, pretend that these are words in a language that makes no sense at all. These are just random letters. Let's try that. So these are just random letters. They don't mean anything at all, okay? Just read them as if they're random. Go. So you're contaminated by a rehearsal in this case, but uh, even with a couple seconds of intro, uh, there is some effect. Uh, when you actually spend some time to hypnotize people, it works better. And if you had been reading the opposite column from the language you know well, again, it would be a lot easier. Um, the last example I have is uh, a little bit unusual. 
Um, so half of the room, please stand up. Uh, what I want you to do is for the next 30 seconds, run, as pl run in place as fast as possible. I want you to get your heart rate up and your adrenaline pumping. The other half of the room, close your eyes, relax, breathe slowly, seven seconds in, seven seconds out, relax and be calm, okay? Ready? Go. Okay, sit back down. Okay, heart rate up, yeah? Nod, bouncy, good. Okay, uh, I don't know what your sexual orientation is, so pick one. Whichever gender you prefer, go for that. How hot is this person? One to 10, who thinks? <laughs> who thinks one? Yes, how attractive. Would you want to sleep with them? Would you go on a date? One? One is worse, sorry. Two? Three? Sorry, 10, one to 10. 10 is the hottest. Three, four, five, Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. <laughs> so those of you on this side of the room gave a higher number than those of you on this side of the room. Why is that? This is something called uh, emotional contagion uh, theory of uh, or uh, it's a physiological contagion of emotional processing. Um, what happens is you have an adrenaline rush going right now. Well, you guys do. Uh, <laughs> um, and the feeling of sexual arousal is actually uh, shares a lot with the feeling of mere physiological arousal. Um, and so when you look at someone and you say, hmm, would I sleep with them? If your heart is already pumping, you are more likely to answer yes. This is also why people get laid in clubs. <laughs> um, an interesting other effect that I don't have a slide for is uh, you know the previous thing I said about uh, comparison? So suppose you uh, were choosing between uh, three people. Uh, one who looks uh, uh, like you, um, or sorry, so someone else is choosing between th some three people. One is you, one is uh, someone who looks very different, uh, and one is someone who looks a little bit uglier than you. Are they more likely to choose between you because you have the person who looks a little bit uglier than you or your friend? Which one are they more likely to choose? As opposed to if your friend had the companion who is slightly uglier. The question is actually, they'll choose the person who has the slightly uglier friend. The reason is they're making a comparison. And this is something to bear in mind when picking people to go to that club. <laughs> or when you are being asked to go to a club with someone. <laughs> so, um, shockingly to me, um, I'm actually early. Uh, I was expecting to, this talk to go a lot longer. Um, 
the conclusion I want you to learn is that the biases you have, of which there are a lot more, I've got like four times more in my notes, um, is there are things that you want to be aware of. Just because you think you're rational doesn't mean you are, but if you're aware of the ways in which you're not rational, you're aware in the ways of you can be, that you can be taken advantage of, you can at least do something about it. You can stop and say, hmm, what is it actually more statistically likely to happen? Uh, to get hit by a car or by a suicide bomber? Should I contribute an idea to this conversation before we've discussed it? And so forth. Just stop, be aware. Um, there are a few references I strongly recommend. Uh, the first one is serious. Tversky and Kahneman won the Nobel Prize for their work on heuristics and biases. And that book is absolutely brilliant. Uh, Eliezer Yudkovsky, uh, well, not quite as serious uh, a book. Uh, it's online, Harry Potter and the Methods of Rationality. Uh, it is, however, pretty damn hilarious, and the uh, stuff it talks about that relates to cognitive science is dead on accurate. Uh, Zendo is a great game of induction. Uh, I'm not aware of any actual research in this, unfortunately. Uh, if you are, please let me know. Uh, but the game of Zendo is you're given uh, a pattern and you need to devise what the rule is. Uh, this is something that people d are actually really bad at. So here's, um, here's a different example of the same kind of problem. Suppose you have... Um, <laughs> mm, suppose you're at a club, you're the bouncer. Um, and you need to know uh, whether people can get in or not. Uh, or rather, you're going to get busted if someone's in there who doesn't have ID and who's drinking. Um, you know uh, one person who's in there that you have checked their ID. You know one person who's in there who's drinking. You know one person on the outside you've checked their ID, on the outside, who's already drinking. Um, whose ID do you need to check? Who do you need to check out more thoroughly? Yeah. Um, the thing is, when you present this in a more abstract way, um, people suck at it. And the reason is they have a confirmation bias. Um, the, when they try to understand a problem. Instead of thinking, oh, what might disprove my rule? They say, oh, what information can I give that will prove my rule? Here's another interesting example. Take the series two, four, six. What is the rule for this series? You can ask me any question you want about an example series, and I'll tell you whether or not it fits the rule. I'll, I'll tell you that it has to be uh, integers, three integers, and that order matters. So give me a series, and I'll tell you whether or not it fits the rule. And you can tell me what you think the rule is. Shout it out. 10, 10 12, 14 fits. Next. 1, 1,999. 1, 1,999 fits. One, one, one fits. Anyone have an idea what the rule is? <laughs> yes. So the thing is, when you ask people this problem one-on-one, -on -one, as opposed to a lot of people thinking about it, what they'll say is, okay, two, four, six. Hmm, that looks like uh, a series of even numbers. Does four, eight, ten fit? Yes. Does 12, 14, 16 fit? Yes. Well, I must be right. And the thing is, well, you're sort of part of right. <laughs> um, but you didn't consider all the options, and you didn't try to disprove your theory. And that's really important. Um, I think I actually have time for questions. 
Uh, first off, thanks to everybody who contributed. Um, yeah. And uh, if you come to the extended Q&A later, uh, I will prepare a whole lot more examples that I didn't think I would have time to get to. Where, where are you doing your extended Q&A? Uh, A03. Okay. So that's the workshop room downstairs. Very good. Questions? All right, hang on, hang on a minute, hang on. Yeah. We're, we're going to try and do this in a sort of faintly organized kind of fashion here. <laughs> Otherwise, you'll all end up shouting and it'll be a disaster. So, um, there should be an audio angel with another mic who's at the back there. Um, right, if you want to ask a question, put your hand up. Okay, so these guys oh, are the front. By the way, I absolutely love getting feedback. So, there's uh, a feedback page on the conference wiki that I have no control over and is really anonymous. Uh, there's also this that I have control over but is anonymous anyway. Uh, all I get is a timestamp. So, I appreciate your feedback. Okay, so what we'll do is we're going to work from the back of the room coming forward. So, that gentleman there who currently has the mic, speak into the mic and ask your question clearly. Yes, um, you. How, how likely is it actually to get killed outside the green zone during an Afghanistan holiday? How likely is it that you'll get killed outside the green zone in a terrorist attack? Um, I don't know the statistic on that. Uh, what I do know is a similar example. Um, which is uh, the deaths in Israel due to terrorism uh, in airports. Uh, and the answer in that case is you're more likely to get hit by lightning. Okay, so um, next question. Uh, that gentleman there in the uh, stand up, you. Yes, you. Yes, you. <laughs> You're pointing at someone in front of me. It's hard to know which one. And um, the question about the gay marriage example, um, yeah. is it possible that there's some sort of bias going on there to the extent that people more in favor of gay marriage are also more likely to socialize with and therefore know gay people and also gay people are more likely to be out to their friends? Has that been corrected for in the study you cited? So yes, you, you're, you're pointing out a good problem. Correlation is not causation. Um, so the thing I pointed to was actually a Gallup poll conducted last year. Um, and a poll has no way to detect causation. Yeah? Can, guys who are leaving, hey you, leaving people, go through the front exit. There's a huge queue of people at the back, you'll just make things complicated. Leave through the front exit. Okay, sorry Sai, continue. Um, so the answer is yes, it's causal. Uh, this has been investigated separately. Uh, no, that result does not prove causality. Um, and the thing is, you can, you can think of people like, for example, Dan Savage, um, uh, a noted gay sex columnist uh, with uh, conservative Catholic parents, uh, at least conservative when he hadn't yet come out. Uh, he came out and they suddenly weren't quite so gay bashing anymore. Why? Because they were bashing their kid and they loved their kid. Um, and this is basically why people should out themselves. Because if everybody knows someone, whether or not it's you know, someone they would have willingly gone and sought to know someone who's gay, uh, they'll say, oh, you know, this is Bob, I like Bob. Um, Bob is a perfectly cool guy. Or they hate you. Or they hate you, in which case maybe this doesn't work, but, you know. <laughs> uh, it's not more likely than not that they'll hate you to begin with, although Phelps <laughs> would be an interesting counterexample. Um, anyway, yeah, okay, next question. Okay, next question. Um, we have one from IRC, then this gentleman, and then this gentleman. He's had his hand up for ages. <laughs> So in the IRC, there's a very positive feedback, feedback about your talk, and there's a question, um, where can I find references to the more things to do to choose from leads to more unsatisfying decision phenomenon? I'm sorry, say it again. Where can I find references? To the more things to, to choose from leads to more unsatisfying decisions oh, phenomenon. Yes. Um, so Paradox of Choice is actually the name of a book and uh, a few talks 
Uh, oh, I met the guy even. I'm bl totally blanking on his name. Um, Schwartz, yes. Um, Barry Schwartz. Uh, I think he's in UC Irvine. I'm not, I don't remember exactly. But Barry Schwartz has talked extensively about this. Yes, by Barry Schwartz. Um, yeah. uh, sorry, there is a TED talk, someone said. Yeah. Okay, what do you mean by, hyp by hypnotizing? Um, hypnosis? Follow the, the finger? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, in this case, hypnosis uh, meant they uh, got someone into a nice, relaxed state, and they gave them the suggestion that what they were about to read was uh, written in a foreign language that they did not know, uh, and so forth. Uh, the effect was not large. The effect was, I think, like a, a like 20% or so reduction uh, in the Stroop effect, but it was still significant. Um, other than things like that, it's actually really, really, really hard to suppress the Stroop effect. Um, so it's actually surprising that they showed a result at all. Uh, and if you want the reference, I can give it to you. I don't think I have it on the slide. Hey, so yeah. That was pretty awesome. You should do version number two next year or something. You've read the, the Black Swan then? Uh, yeah. Cause, okay, so conf confirmation bias is a huge thing. So what do you think um, we can do it for, with our brains and with systems to avoid confirmation bias? What would be one thing that you've discovered or in terms of your mind and the way you think? Avoiding confirmation bias. Um, so one thing is, uh, so the, you know the jury example I gave uh, where you're contaminated by the fact that you already know the bridge collapsed. Um, this is why you don't tell the jury that the bridge collapsed. This is why it's stricken from the record. This is also why if you're, if you're discussing a problem where there is something that might come up that would contaminate people, you try to make sure that the people discussing it are not contaminated by that. that Either it's a separate group of people who are evaluating it, or you bring up the issue only later, uh, or so forth. Uh, there's, once, once you have been contaminated by an idea, it's really, really hard to suppress it. The other thing you can do to prevent it is to explicitly seek disconfirmation of your beliefs. So. This is something that comes up again in religion, for example, in politics, uh, and so forth. It's called science, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, science is not religion, you may have noticed. Um, so what, you, what people normally do is they go to some event with a predisposition as to how to interpret that event. So for example, if I were to cross the street and a car driving across the snowy, icy streets of Berlin, skidded uh, just past me, missing me by an inch. I would think, wow, that was lucky. Um, and thank you to the road engineers of Berlin who salted the roads so that it didn't hit me. A religious person who experienced that would say, thank you, God, for sparing my life. Now. I can't prove that they're wrong. However, I can say that it's much, much more likely that they thought that than I did. And the reason is because they're confirming a prior belief rather than explicitly trying to disconfirm it. If you do explicitly try to disconfirm your beliefs, if you say, hmm, what is the likely, uh, likelihood of intercessory prayer working? What is the rate of accidents for people who are fervent Christians versus not? You'll find that it's basically the same. Um, and as a result, you might disconfirm your belief that intercessory prayer works. Or you might not. But at least you've got a chance. Next.
One, two, okay. I want to rescue some people who are very disappointed with their um, possibilities to evaluate risks. Uh -huh. And um, our risk evaluation is not that bad. Okay, there are more people killed by pigs than by sharks. Well, perhaps there's a reason. Perhaps it's because people are aware that sharks may be dangerous and it's dangerous if a shark bites you and eats you. It's not good for your life expectancy. So, <laughs> if you, if you for example, um, learn how to dive, it's part of the course that they tell you, you know, if there's a mm -hmm. shark, stay calm, don't do this and this movement, um, which, which yeah. has an impact on the statistics. And, and this is likewise because with aware. terrorism, uh, we're very, very, very careful to scan the hell out of my juice, just in case <laughs> it's a bomb. And as a result, uh, we make sure that no explosive juice makes it onto an airplane. Well, um, there's, there's two counterpoints that I would give to you on that. Uh, one is, there's this great video on YouTube, there always is, <laughs> uh, about a councilman in a, a, a city in California um, being quoted and saying, uh, in regards to a, a patch of very smelly garlic uh, that had been planted, uh, that citizens were complaining about, uh, and he was protesting uh, the proposal to remove them. Why? Well, the reason they were originally installed was to protect us against vampires, and since then, I haven't seen a single vampire. <laughs> Uh, another example, uh, you know those religions where they used to believe that if uh, you don't sacrifice a person on the temple uh, every day, the sun won't rise tomorrow? Well, they kept sacrificing people and the sun kept rising. What does that prove? <laughs> to them, How is that the context that sample to what I said? Yes. Um, this is a problem though. Um, if you don't actively test your beliefs, um, it's really hard to know that you believe the right thing. Next. Uh, okay, so how many minutes have we what got time? here? So we've got literally time here for one question. So uh, um, under normal circumstances, I'll have you fight. Um, <laughs> Oh, okay, so what we'll do, okay, we've got there two questions. There is an extended Q&A, a, a whole then, hour tonight. Yeah, and or you can IRC. stop me in the hall. Or you so can get my card. You, and then IRC, and then we'll call it. Just, uh, just wondering, uh, the example you gave about uh, actually reading through those words and the colors uh, and the mind that, and uh -huh. your brain and the actions, what's actually happening there. Uh, what's the impact, or have there been any studies on uh, kids that grow up bilingual or even multilingual? Uh, is that going to change that scenario, and how? Oh, uh, the answer is uh, fairly simple. If you uh, are native language, you will perform identically, basically. Uh, so uh, if, if, you're, if you're bilingual, um, and there isn't that much interference between the two, and more to the point, uh, the Stroop task depends on whether you're automatically processing the words. Uh, if you are automatically processing it, as opposed to having to think about it and say, hmm, what does vice mean, or uh, so forth, like I would have to, uh, then you are vulnerable. Okay, we'll take the last question from IRC. Yes, and then, IRC, uh, what okay. does IRC have to say? So the question from Frozen Eyes is whether there's a um, list of these, of all these effects, that, like a resource that collects all these effects and where you can look it up instead mm -hmm. of reading like five books. <laughs> <laughs> That's well, very lazy. Yes. Um, for one, I would say that this book actually is an excellent list uh, of heuristics and biases. Which book? Uh, oh, sorry. The, the one that's not easy. Yes. Uh, this book, Judgment Under Uncertainty by Tversky and Kahneman, is an excellent book. Um, there's a uh, blog run uh, by Eliezer Yudkowsky, among others, uh, called, um, sorry? Yeah, less wrong, lesswrong.org, I think, um, which comes up with these things all the time. Uh, Eliezer also has uh, a nice paper 
uh, about uh, assessment of global risks, which lists a bunch. Uh, but I think, uh, oh, also Wikipedia has a list of um, uh, biases, uh, cognitive biases that is actually quite comprehensive and if you just want a list of, of biases, actually I would suggest the Wikipedia list is the first place to go. Thank you. Okay, and that concludes questions. Remember, if you do have more questions, there is the workshop session yep. downstairs later this evening. Or you can stop me. If you want my card, it's here. Outside this room. 